I'm Historical Method Man, and this is The Sharpeville Massacre, Violence and the Struggles of the African National Congress, 1960-1990. On May 26, 1948, the South African white electorate placed the exclusively Afrikaner National Party into power under Prime Minister Dr. Daniel Milan. Fearing the strong African majority, the National Party implemented a complex series of discriminatory laws that ended up being the basis of 40 years of institutionalized racial segregation, which became known as apartheid. The Afrikaner-dominated South African government sought to remove the so-called black danger from society through the passing of laws like the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, the Immorality Act, which banned interracial and homosexual sex, and the Population Registrations Act, which labeled all South Africans by race. Milan further resettled thousands of black South Africans into poverty-stricken Bantu stands, and South African society was forever changed. Obviously, most black South Africans were unhappy about these changes, as they had yet to be enfranchised. Organizations like the African National Congress, the ANC, devoted themselves to nonviolent resistance against apartheid, and it began to soar in both membership and influence. The ANC's initial defiance campaign proves that their preferred method of resistance was peaceful and nonviolent. Boycotts, hunger strikes, and grassroots organization were the cornerstone of the ANC's pre sharpeville methods of liberation. However, the Sharpeville massacre marked a turning point where seeing the shortcomings of a purely nonviolent resistance, Nelson Mandela shifted the ANC's methods to incorporate the practicality of violence. His plan to combine nonviolent resistance with sabotage and the building of an ANC military wing post Sharpeville demonstrates this change. ANC internal writings prove that the Sharpeville massacre on March 21, 1960, marked a change in the ANC's attitudes towards violence as a means of resistance. The massacre and subsequent banning of the ANC represented the urgency of the anti apartheid movement. So Mandela and the ANC created Unconto e Siswe as a quick and direct response to the National Party's reactionary actions. While never resorting to a full-scale armed insurgency, the ANC's shift towards using violence as armed propaganda showed Mandela's limited yet present belief in violence. Mandela's military training by the Algerian army and the actual implementation of violent sabotage diversified the ANC's toolbox of resistance. Despite Mandela's shift towards violence, the ANC continued to use peaceful methods until negotiations to end apartheid came in 1990. Here, the ANC organized and executed dozens of highly organized, controlled, and peaceful protests. An early event of the Defiance Campaign was a response to the separate representations of voters' bill, which revoked the rights of many Africans and so-called colored men in and around Cape Town. The ANC backed the Franchise Action Council, and its subsequent peaceful march through the streets of the Cape. Similarly, and I quote, thousands of volunteers refused to obey segregationist rules at bus stops, train stations, post offices, and so on, generally in an orderly and peaceful manner. Obeying the peaceful requisites of civil disobedience, the Defiance Campaign accepted the jailing and mass imprisonment of their volunteers. Thousands of supporters, quote, had voluntarily went to jail despite the intimidating effect of police action, of dismissal by employers, and the propaganda of the bulk of the press and the radio. Some teachers who had done little before had thrown up their jobs to defy." End quote. The ANC engaged in countless more peaceful methods like boycotts against Rupert Group cigarettes and the Putco bus service. Over the course of the 1950s, the Defiance Campaign became a full-fledged non-cooperation movement similar to its massive counterpart in India and the United States, and sharing litanies of methods. The Defias campaign's commitment to nonviolence was often expressed in public statements. A statement on the Defiance campaign's spread to the East clearly expressed that the Natal branch of the ANC, quote, supported the decision to launch a campaign of nonviolent passive resistance against discriminatory and unjust laws in the Union of South Africa with the object and hope of getting white South Africa to adopt a policy of allowing full democratic rights for all who qualify for them." End quote. Similarly, the Freedom Charter of 1955, a statement of the core principles of the ANC and its allies, 
symbolizes the extent to which the Congress valued peace as a virtue for South Africa. Alongside demanding the right to universal suffrage, a fair justice system, and comprehensive rights for workers, the Charter aimed to foster cultural change on the basis of peace, friendship, and harmony. The concept of peace was ingrained in the ANC's doctrine and actions in the 1950s, and the ANC actively denounced violence committed in its name by radicals. Before Sharpeville, the Congress valued passive resistance above all other methods of struggle, and the Defiance Campaign shows the extent to which the ANC valued nonviolent opposition to apartheid. During the 1950s, the ANC was completely devoted to nonviolent means of resistance. Nevertheless, the government under the National Party met this resistance with violence. Much of this violence occurred through the legal system. When jails became overcrowded with volunteers, the government hastily allowed judges to sentence demonstrators to lashings alongside three-year terms. Despite the constant repression of not only resistors, but also all other Africans, there was no one specific act of brutality that the ANC could rally behind through the 1950s Defias campaign. So, it was difficult for the Congress to gain momentum and membership. The ANC's nonviolent methods were strong, yet the government did not listen. The turn of the 1960s and the Sharpeville massacre would be the inciting moment when the ANC realized their tactics must shift. On Monday, March 21st, 1960, the ANC breakaway organization, the Pan-African Congress, the PAC, rallied upwards thousands of protesters together to be voluntarily arrested for not carrying their identification passes in front of the Sharpeville police station. In an attempt to discourage protesters, the government set jets and armored cars while police and angry yet nonviolent protesters stood in Devon. Consequently, chaos broke out and the ground was soon riddled with 69 South African corpses. The 178 wounded, over half of them shot in the back while running away, were all placed under mass arrest at the hospital. The international community was appalled after seeing images of two armed police officers washing over a field of the dead. These police were praised for their actions soon after. Following the events of Sharpeville, the federal government declared a state of emergency, jailed tens of thousands, and banned the African National Congress and Pan-African Congress under the suppression of communism. The ANC, forced to go underground, realized that their methods of peaceful protest were not effective enough. In his famous I am prepared to die speech, Nelson Mandela explained that it would be unrealistic and wrong for African leaders to continue preaching peace and non-violence at a time when a government met our peaceful demands with force. Other ANC leaders agreed with Mandela's statement, but of course, internal opposition rose. Mandela also realized that violence caused by impatient radicals who took matters into their own hands complicated the stance of the ANC. Mandela believed that the government leading up to and culminating in the Sharpeville massacre, quote, pointed clearly to the inevitable growth amongst Africans of the belief that violence was the only way out. It showed that a government which uses force to maintain its rule attempts to assassinate Prime Minister Hendrik Verwoerd. The day after the banning of the ANC and PAC showed the growing pains of Black South Africans. Mandela was keenly aware of breakaways and radicals who were willing to put matters into their own hands. Realizing the frustration of an oppressed people, Mandela called for an ANC committee meeting on June 1961. Here and then, he proposed the formation of a military organization. It would be naive to assume that Mandela's proposal immediately created a military wing, for the Congress was by no means an, an ideologically homogenous party. Some, like President Albert Luthuli, who was world-renowned for his belief in nonviolent resistance, were quite hardline regarding adopting more violent methods. ANC member Moses Cotain was one of the most vocal critics of the adoption of an armed struggle, arguing that the Congress was not prepared for the consequences of violent resistance. Both moral and logistical arguments, both for and against the creation of a military wing, persisted. Internal discussions continued throughout 1961, and the ANC concluded that it will still be publicly committed to nonviolent resistance. Yet, 
many key members organized the creation of a separate but still associated organization called Nkonto e Sizwe, Zulu for Spear of the Nation. Along with the intense overlapping leaders and organizers, the Congress and Nkonto e Sizwe shared key information. Years later, during the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, the ANC accepted responsibility for many violent actions committed by Nkonto e Sizwe. While these two organizations were technically separated, Nkonto e Sizwe was a de facto servant to the ANC. Regarding the methods of Nkonto e Sizwe, they were limited to sabotage and relatively smaller scale violence rather than an all out guerrilla campaign. During the Ribiodia trial of 1964, Mandela recalled his thought process regarding violence as a means of resistance. Four forms of violence are possible. There is sabotage, there is guerrilla warfare, there is terrorism, and there is open revolution. We chose to adopt the first method and to test it fully before taking on any other decision. Sabotage did not involve the loss of life, and this is what we said in our manifesto. Exhibit AD, I quote, we of Nkonto e Sizwe have always sought to achieve liberation without bloodshed and civil clash. End quote. The context of this quote, Mandela was defending himself and his involvement in organizing Nkonto e Sizwe during the trial. However, this context does not change the fact that the Congress and Nkonto e Sizwe were committed to using some form of violence as a means of resistance. In their December 1961 manifesto, Nkonto e Sizwe declared that there remained only two choices, submit or fight. Realizing that, the government has interpreted the peacefulness of the ANC's movement as a weakness. The people's nonviolent policies have been taken as a green light for government violence. So, the methods of Nkonto e Sizwe will mark a break with that past. End quote. After seeing how the police and federal government reacted to civil disobedience in Sharpville, the ANC and Nkonto e Sizwe realized that the government would no longer permit a peaceful resistance to apartheid. So, they committed themselves to work with new methods, switching out boycotts in favor of bombings. Letters from ANC leader Oliver Tambo seeking international support in the late 1980s revealed how the Congress reacted to the events in Sharpville. He mentioned the ANC's history of peaceful strategy to defeat apartheid and he noted that their strategies changed with Sharpville as the turning point. Every avenue of nonviolent protest was met with violent repression on the part of the regime, culminating in the banning of the ANC after the Sharpville massacre in 1960. The regime turned South Africa into an armed camp. The ANC went underground, determined to find new methods of struggle. 1961 saw the formation of Nkonto e Sizwe, our People's Army, our striking force for final liberation. The violence of the regime was now to be met by the revolutionary violence of the people. Since then, the ANC has combined political and armed struggle to defeat apartheid. Through writing their own history and narrative, the Congress attributed their violence to the events in Sharpville. The massacre became a symbol of the ANC's frustrations, and they rallied behind this event to justify their anti-apartheid violence. While Nkonto e Sizwe was founded as a separate organization, in this letter, Tambo claims the army as being a branch of the ANC, using the possessive hour. This hour is important because it fully proves the connection between the Congress and Nkonto e Sizwe. These two organizations were united, despite their strategic denial of correspondence from years and trials past. It is known that Mandela was an instrumental figure in the creation of Nkonto e Sizwe, and his travels throughout Africa before his arrest in 1962 show his dedication to violence as an act of resistance. In 1962, Nelson Mandela met with leaders of the Algerian National Liberation Army, the ALN, which at the time just overcame settler oppression. In Algeria, the ALN taught Mandela about equipment, strategies, and many other skills necessary to successfully lead an army in the future. His detailed notes were used as evidence against him during the Ribionia trial two years later, and Mandela admitted that he intended to educate himself on guerrilla warfare in case the struggle escalated. His experience with the Algerian National Liberation Army 
further proved that Mandela was fully committed to using violence for liberation, closely following the events in Sharpeville. And this marks a clear shift on the ANC's policy towards violence. There are hundreds of examples of violence enacted by Nkonto Sizwe, and most of them are outlined by South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This was a body that sought to transition the country into an inclusive democracy through a restorative justice in 1966. Witnesses and victims of violence could tell their stories in public hearings, while perpetrators of said violence could request amnesty by providing information about violence committed during the years of apartheid. Due to the messy nature of resistance, some acts of violence described in the Truth and Reconciliation Report were unplanned attacks coordinated by more radical members of Nkonto Esizwe. Because this commission was designed as a form of restorative justice, aimed at fostering healing between victims and perpetrators. Many acts of sabotage, which only destroyed property, have been excluded from the report. One instance of violence enacted by Mkonto Sizwe, outlined in the Truth and Reconciliation Report, was the bombing of Magu's Bar in Durban in 1986. Here, over 60 civilians were injured and three were killed as a car bomb exploded directly outside. The ANC claimed that they were trying to take the struggle out of black majority areas and into white ones, aiming for the nearby Why Not Bar that many off-duty security branch officers frequented. The Ngonto Sizwe militant Robert McBride, who carried out this attack, stated that Magoo's was never an intended target. His cell was to kill enemy personnel. That's it. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission found the Congress, rather than Ngonto Sizwe, responsible for the actions carried out during these anti-apartheid bombing campaigns. While there was technically a separate yet associated organization, Nkonto Sizwe was under the authority of the ANC. Nkonto Sizwe also engaged in other forms of violent resistance from the mid-60s to the end of apartheid. They killed dozens of individuals that they deemed enemies and or defectors. They also planted landmines in public spaces and sometimes necklaced their targets, forcing them into tires coated in kerosene and burning them alive. While the Congress did not order these necklacing attacks, they neither acted firmly to control their youth militia, nor publicly condemned these gross violations of human rights. The ANC either directly supported, took responsibility for, or turned a blind eye towards Nkontoe Sizwe's violent methods. It is important to also recognize the continuity of the ANC's ever-present use of nonviolent resistance, which continued past Shark Bill until negotiations in the early 1990s. Methods similar to those used in the American Civil Rights Movement were used later in the ANC's anti-apartheid campaign. The Congress backed and expanded regional acts of civil disobedience, a notable example being when strikes by meat workers in the Western Cape turned into nationwide red meat boycotts. The ANC also helped spread the Transvaal red boycotts against abysmal living conditions over the course of two years. Eventually, 60% of black South Africans were not paying rent. The Congress's peaceful methods were just as strong, if not stronger than, the defiance campaign before the Sharpeville massacre. They managed to keep their focus on passive resistance, as Nkonto Sizwe backed up their campaign with smaller acts of armed propaganda. The ANC also organized and supported many nationwide general strikes. One strike in Transvaal in 1984 had 800,000 people and 400,000 more students refusing to go to work or school. Government-owned plants that produced oil, coal, iron, and steel saw production screech to a halt. Worker militancy, another form of peaceful protest, was used to place some of the government's most profitable Paris hotels under pressure. Four years later, three million workers were able to immobilize industry across Pretoria, Cape Town, and Johannesburg. In the late 1980s, the ANC's toolbox of resistance was filled to the brim. The Congress saw participation soar as South Africa's people became exponentially frustrated with the system of apartheid, and they finally had the numbers to effectively challenge the government. Nkonto Sizwe's attacks became more frequent and more extreme throughout the late 1980s. The South African government and economy grew weaker as the international community imposed economic sanctions. Domestic pressures, whether they be violent or peaceful, 
and forum ones eventually led to negotiations to end apartheid in the early 1990s. The end of apartheid and the creation of a new constitution, based on the principles outlined in the 1955 Freedom Charter, showed the ANC's multifaceted effort finally bearing fruit. Before Sharpeville, the Congress was completely devoted to nonviolent means of resistance with its defiance campaign. Sharpeville changed everything, and the ANC realized the government's refusal to accept any peaceful protest. The ANC escalated its methods and began to respond with their own violence in the form of its military wing, in Conto e Sizwe. The Sharpeville massacre was the breaking point for the ANC, and internal dialogues led by Mandela in response to the government's crackdown on nonviolent resistance best exemplifies this change.